Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled Convergence of Cybersecurity and Fraud, part of Bright Talks AI and Machine Learning in Financial Services 2019 Summit. My name is Julia Good and I will be your moderator for this webcast. Our presenter today is Dr. Srinivas Mukamala, CEO and co-founder of RiskSense and a recognized expert on AI and neutral networks. We are very excited to share with you today how a risk-based approach can facilitate the convergence of cybersecurity and fraud. Before we get started, if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please submit them via BrightTalk so we can address them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will pass it over to Srinivas, and he can jump into today's webinar. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. So the interesting thing we're going to talk today about is uh, there is a lot of excitement around AI. There is also a lot of maturity in data pipelines today. And there is also interesting aspects on how we can actually use big data. So before I jump in, there's also a need to start bringing cybersecurity and fraud detection together. The hypothesis here is if you take a look at majority of the fraudulent incidents today, be it the swift attack in Bangladesh, be it some of the major data breaches where the identities are stolen and they're reused to generate synthetic IDs and commit credit card fraud or credit fraud or acquire loans in an illegal way. So there's always the symbiotic relationship. Is cyber security incident a precursor or a postcursor? And when and where the fraud really happens? So that's really what I want to cover today. I think it's very important to start thinking about it. And in my personal view, AI can be really a great bridge of bringing two siloed disparate functions into a collaborative approach to really address the risk. End of the day, fraud is addressing a business risk. Cybersecurity, not quite yet, but that's the strife we all are trying to make. Can cybersecurity be a risk-based decision? And how can we, if both common denominator is risk, how do you bring them together? And can AI be that facilitator? The answer is yes. So before we jump in, one of the most important things that will even facilitate this convergence is it's always important to remember for any analytics to work, for any AI to work, we should have large volumes of data. So today we have systems of record, we have systems of truth, and we also have systems of intelligence. So the most important thing for us all to remember is, do we have systems of truth and do we have systems of record? The answer is today, yes. The financial industry has invested enough money to collect data that can be reused for multiple various things, be it marketing, be it personalized services, be it cybersecurity, be it fraud detection. It is the same type of data. You can use it in different facets. So we have access to large volumes of reusable data. Now, because of the maturity in artificial intelligence and the scale at which we can use AI, it will make our iterative process or trail and error a lot more easier. You can build a model try out if it's working. If it's not, repeat and rinse it till it really works. So what are the most important things to consider? So AI can be effectively used to identify your behavioral patterns. And I purposely added human and digital. The reason is, if you take a look at fraud, we tend to be heavily human behavior centric and a little bit on the digital. It's not quite equally weighed, right? At the same time, when you start looking at cybersecurity, we tend to focus very digital-centric and little light on the human behavior itself. So you can see already the marriage here. When you combine the human and the digital, you can start really looking for some 
good patterns and any anonymous behavior. That's the number one thing. The second one, when I talked about systems of record and systems of truth, because of digitization today, you have the opportunity to have cleaner, much richer data at your disposal, and it's very important. And I purposely showed the linked analysis here, graph. The most important thing here is when you have data coming from disparate systems, you want to figure out the context, and you also want to make sure you have a clear understanding about how this data is interlinked. It's a very, very important concept. When we talk convergence, we got to understand and have the context on the data. And the next most important thing is any major financial institution today have access to some sort of a data pipeline. For simplicity, let's call it big data, right? And all the major cloud providers provide several big data frameworks for you to not only consume the data, process the data, aggregate the data, and actually present it in a way that you can extract intelligence. I mean, call it systems of intelligence, right? And ultimately, what facilitates this is your APIs. The reason is you can't have humans triage data from a system to a system to a system because you want to process, make addition, take that output that becomes an input to another system, process, digest, that becomes an input to another system. So there's interlinking of systems, and the only way you'll be able to actually do that and unlock the insights is through APIs. So with that, I want to make sure we have the fundamentals here, that what we are trying to accomplish and what we are trying to do. And if you take a look at what are the most common detection methods, again, I'm trying to get to the common denominators, right? If you take a look at what's been working and what worked for several years is rule-based systems. Still today, majority of the fraud detection and majority of the cybersecurity are still based on rule-based. By the way, rule-based is nothing bad. I mean, that's how human cognition works, right? It's if then. But humans can do it at multi-dimension, whereas systems have to be really be built carefully so we're not creating false alarms. So the most common thing is rule-based. And you're also seeing folks getting into machine learning quite a bit. And then ultimately, what we're trying to do is combine the link analysis, in other words, bring context to the data types, bring context to the different systems of record, and bring context to your ultimate reasoning and what kind of outputs you're doing. So it's important to understand what is the common denominator here. So when we, word the con we use the word convergence, so this is where it gets very interesting, right? Simultaneously, you're running your cybersecurity on one of these methods and you're running a fraud detection on one of these methods. What we are not doing today is an ensemble approach. What that means is, can I take a cyber security breach, take that information and feed it into my fraud detection system? Now you're talking really taking an output from an already known observed behavior, feeding it as an input, to enrich and provide a prior knowledge to your fraud detection system or vice versa. So this is where it gets very interesting and you can make the systems work with each other. That's exactly what we're talking about. But it's important to understand, step back and look at what the fundamentals are. And if you continue the path, let's, let's again pay one minute attention to what does AI really mean? The first most important thing is AI is not going to displace the experts or the humans. Let's all be clear. It's going to only empower. It's going to only make your life easier from an automation perspective. It's going to remove the mundane processing of the data. So there are a lot of process automation stuff that gets in. There's also a lot of addition reasoning that gets in. So I'm talking about removing the process, the mundane process, right? That's process automation. When it comes to pure AI, it's very important to understand AI will give you probable answers. It's never definitive, right? Again, we can get into the point of classification and regression, right? Classification is simply yes or no. Regression might be a quantified numeric value. 
So, but it's very important to understand still, it's a probable answer, which means you're going to have false alarms. You're going to have wrong answers, right? So this is where it gets interesting. How many wrong answers are we willing to accept, right? If it's an incident that's going to take down the entire internet, or if it's an incident that's going to cost half a billion dollars, I don't think that's a false alarm we can live with. It's very important to understand what is that we're willing to consider and accept the false alarm rate to be. And ultimately, AI is no more a buzzword. It can really solve some very interesting problems. I think it's important to stress the point the domain expertise is still a very important component. Your AI is as good as what your training data set is, as good as what your domain experts are training it to be, and then ultimately you want to validate on a repeatable process. You remember I was talking about the wrong answers, the false alarms. You want to continuously tune your system to make sure it's not repeatedly making the same wrong decisions over and over again, right? It's like how you do the learning process to the human beings. And what is that we're trying to achieve? End of the day, we're trying to generalize the system. I mean, when you talk to any uh, expert, everything is measured based on generalization. How well can I detect, right? Again, when you step back, it's nothing but generalization. But again, it's super important. AI can be good at one thing or some things, not everything, because you don't want to have a misnomer. AI is going to be great. And it's also very important to understand that artificial intelligence does not have casual models. It is very, very important. A human cognition can spot anomalies very faster. We don't have to be trained on an anomaly. We can still use common sense and casual models to spot something not right. However, your AI does not have the ability to on the fly build a casual model and spot something that's bad. It's very important. It has to have a prior knowledge. And it's also very dependent on the type of data it's being built and learned on. Again, so it's very important to spend time tuning the data and improving your data, right? And the other important thing a lot of people tend to forget and we as an industry are not paying attention to is biased. Your system is biased based on your expert. It's biased based on the data you're feeding in. So AI bias at some point is a real issue to be dealt with for good and bad, and we want to make sure we're addressing that as we move forward. So from a real understanding perspective, the three things again to remember, your system is as good as on what you're being training it on. It's as good as what it's being learned on, the data. And it's also important to make sure we're not introducing biases. And I also use the word casual models, right? Again, a casual model means you're dynamically building a model by looking at and observing a type of a data that you are not trained on before. It's super important. As humans, we can look at a particular object which we are not used to and we can tell if it's good or bad or jump to a conclusion. We were not trained on that. Whereas AI, a casual model means if it hasn't seen that, it can build a model or a cognitive recognition to go do something. So that's really what that important topic is. If AI gets to the strength of building casual models, then we are talking some serious cognitive power that we don't have today. So the next most important thing is, again, I'm stressing the point, if you have access to artificial intelligence, how about attackers? We talked about we have access to data. We talked about all the cloud provides provide the compute. They provide AI models. They provide big data, data pipelines. Well, this is the exact same infrastructure a bad guy has at internet scale. He also has something to his advantage. He has time. Whereas a defender, you don't have time. You are doing your tactical stuff. Again, it's very important to understand of the bad guys have access to AI as well. Again, I stress the point. It's important to understand bias. 
if you are training your system on a particular thing and you miss on a particular model, if a bad guy can figure that out, he's going to exploit that to his maximum thing. Right? That's from a context of fraud and cybersecurity. Again, it's important to really do that. And important topic, a lot of AI folks miss on is the imbalanced data set. You want to balance it, right? Majority of the times what you typically see is you see undersampling or oversampling. Let's take a minute to talk about this. If you take a look at fraud and if you look at cybersecurity, we have a very small representation of the data. And if you talk to anybody in cyber insurance, they talk about we don't have enough actuarial data to really build out an insurance model. Whereas when you look at catastrophe modeling and others, you have enough data, right? So when it comes to cyber, we have very limited data sets of what I consider positive classes. Breach data, your fraud data, your cyber crime data, and so forth. Whereas from a normal data, perspective, data set perspective, you have lots of data. I mean, we all know that. What we don't want to do is we don't want to skew your data set by shrinking your availability of your normal data set and then sizing it to your positive class. Then what happens is you miss out on the real fidelity. And which sample do I pick? Why do I pick it? What's the reason behind it? It kind of creates a complete undersampling. And if you try to do the opposite of simulating your behavior of your positive class, then you might do oversampling. That's when, if you do oversampling, naturally you're going to do overfitting, right? You don't generalize, you memorize. It's a very big problem in artificial intelligence. You don't want your system to memorize, you want your system to be able to generalize it. Again, it's very important to understand the composition of the data set, and this is where you have to iteratively run experiments till you get to a point where you have an optimal data set and you're getting the results the way you want. Right? Again, it's important to really make sure we have that. And what to expect from the data? Because we're talking about convergence here, right? We're talking about cybersecurity and we're talking about fraud. The first most important thing we're trying to understand is what vulnerabilities would be weaponized. That's the first artificial intelligence slash machine learning problem we're trying to solve. Not every vulnerability is weaponized today. And I'll provide you some real data and real context into it. So what we are interested in is if there is a vulnerability out there that's not weaponized. In other words, nobody wrote an exploit, be it the bad guys, be it the white hats, be it the testing engineers within the product who disclosed the vulnerability. So nobody has written an exploit. What is the likelihood of that particular vulnerability having an exploit within the next 30 days, within the 90 days, within 180 days, within 365 days? So the first thing is the classification problem. Will it be weaponized? Yes or no? Then it's a regression. How long will it take for somebody to weaponize it? So do you see we are actually solving two things? Depending on how deep you want to go, you can start with the classification, then you can really get down into a regression. Then what you're looking at is, once I know I have an exploit, then I'm very interested in, will that exploit actually be used in a breach. Again, the domain expertise here is we have enough data that shows a particular exploit is used in a breach or we do red teaming and pen testing exercises where we can show that a particular exploit is used to compromise a machine. That is nothing but the susceptibility analysis. You can call it breach susceptibility. Can I predict a breach? Then what do I need to have? I need to know the vulnerability, I need to know the exploit, and the efficacy of the exploit. Again, that becomes a classification. If you want to know, if you have these particular parameters, how soon will I be breached, right? So that's your breach susceptibility problem. Now, it gets even interesting. 
Now I have the weaponization. I input, I'm inputting that into my breach detection. Now I'm taking that data and feeding that into my fraud detection system. So what am I trying to see here? Are any of the systems susceptible to a breach? If so, who are all the users on the systems? At that point, it's fair to assume that the likelihood of this user's data being compromised is very high. We can talk about encryptions, the controls you have, and all that stuff, but simplicity, the likelihood if that system gets breached, the user data on those systems is compromised. That's one way to look at the precursor to a fraud. The other way to look at it is, if that system is vulnerable, can I use the privilege escalation or bypass the user controls to commit fraud? In other words, do unauthorized transactions, create the data within the shopping carts, you know, make my transactional data to suit what I need to do. Again, it's very important to understand, so what are we really trying to accomplish, right? So, looks like uh, we just uh, moved a few slides. I'm going to come back and uh, finish this up. And the next most important thing is, while you're trying to solve these very interesting problems, each one itself represents a model. And the beauty here now is, today, AI will allow you to do an ensemble of models. You can feed a model into another model, or you can collectively aggregate the data from all these individual models and really make some decisions. So what are we looking here for? We're looking for outliers. We're looking for what changed from a min-max. For Ford, transaction is an important thing. If I'm used to making only $50 purchases, or within a range from 50 to 500, suddenly if I see 5,000, that's an anomaly, right? If there is a pre-notion that I'm going to spend, then you mark your system not to flag that. You're actually looking at your outliers. You're looking at what changed. And can you clearly tell what changed, right? Again, that's a very important thing. And you can also start looking at what's new and what to expect. And how are we validating our assumptions, right? The example I gave. 5,000 is out of the blue, but if they haven't done a $5,000 expense and never logged into that system from a particular device and from a geographic location, what do I consider that? You typically see that, right? When you travel on your credit cards, you have that. It's a geolocation. It's a device you're coming from. It's a type of places you typically go to. They call them as behavioral patterns. And then ultimately, increase, decrease frequency. So these are some of the important things you can easily expect from the data today, whereas we spend a lot of time using humans to actually do that. Then let's talk about uh, the vulnerability data set I talked about. The first problem we said was, can I predict the weaponization, right? So let me step back. Before I talk about prediction, let me talk about the data set, and we're talking about the emphasis. If I'm a financial institution, what am I worried about? There are only 117,441 known vulnerabilities to date. It is very important. You're not dealing with millions, billions. You're dealing with 117,000 unique vulnerabilities. Out of them, only 23,000 of the vulnerabilities are weaponized. Again, not every exploit is built alike. When you dissect that, you have denial of service attacks, you have privilege escalation, you have remote code execution, right, and you have web attacks. Let's focus on majority of the breaches. Majority of the breaches happen because of remote code execution and they happen because of privilege escalation. There are only 4,000 known remote code executions. And when you go back and take a look at what's really trending, which ones are the attackers using? Today, there are only 87. So think about this as an agile model. You remember we talked about what's changed, what's new? This is what you should be tracking towards in each bucket. You can go as granular as you want. Once you have this defined, then you can train your systems based on this data and come up with a very crisp prediction of what will be weaponized. If so, what is that I got to do to really ensure that I don't have a cybersecurity problem? Again, very important. It's important to talk about the data set and what we actually use it. 
So the next most important thing is we talked about weaponization prediction, right? So we have the data set. So what we did was we ran this on several machine learning methods. We ran it on random forest, neural networks, support vector machine, regression trees, and about 16 different methods. All of them, of course, random forests, because of the local minima and the sparse data, we were able to get some very good results, right? We're getting accuracies not of 85 to 90 percent on properly predicting which vulnerability will be weaponized. I mean, we're very pleased with the results. Now we're going back and actually tuning the data to see what else can we include as features so we can improve the accuracy. Again, it's important to look at, is this the right data set? Or do we have the right experts to validate what the machine is telling? And are we continuously improving it? So the next most important to look at it is breach susceptibility. Now we have what will be weaponized, and we know which vulnerabilities have what exploits, the type of exploits. Now can we go back and correlate this information on the assets they belong to. So what features are we taking here? We're looking at port count. How many ports are open on that system? What is the service count? How many services are running? We're looking at the sum of severity. How many high severe vulnerabilities do they have? We're looking at the susceptibility. How many vulnerabilities have known malware? We're looking at the exploit count. How many of the vulnerabilities on that system have known exploits? We're looking at the unique vulnerability count. We're looking at the total vulnerability count. We're looking at our recent score, which is computed using 27 different attributes and takes temporal into consideration. We're looking at the network score. What that means is we're looking at your neighbors, your adjacent assets, if they are susceptible, if they are bad, if they are vulnerable. We're looking at that. And we're also looking at is the system externally accessible or not and we're looking at the criticality of the asset based on the CMDP data. Once we were able to do it, I mean, you'll be amazed. We had very high fidelity of telling in a given overall network which segment will be targeted by the attackers. We were also able to tell pen testers very quickly where they should spend their time in trying to get an infiltration in order to carry out a lateral attack. This is fantastic, right? From an offense defense, we're able to tell your defense systems what an offensive guy would do to validate if that's what an offense guy would do. We're able to give the same data to our pen testers and say, hey, can you guys validate it? So the good news, the data set is working, the features we chose were working, and the fidelity is pretty high. So then when we move on to the weaponization, it's important, right? We've been talking about transparency. We're talking about which feature matters? We're talking about letting the world know this is what we use. What are we using? We're using the CVSS base parameters, both in two and three. Your attack vectors, your complexity, privileges required, user interaction, modify the data, and so forth. We're also looking at some very interesting, what I consider second order features. What is the patch release latency? When a particular vulnerability is released, how much time it's taking for the vendor to release a patch? Why is this important? Think about this. If I have a vulnerability, if I have an exploit, or if I don't have an exploit, if I don't have a patch, be assured 90% of the time your organizations are not going to act. When I say not act, there's nothing they can do other than coming up with compensating controls, right? Limit access to the system, put extra monitoring, have your reactive tools, have your detection tools, and all that. In reality, when you're talking networks of hundreds and thousands, who has time to really go understand what compensating control really works? Do, they will still do it depending on the criticality, but that's not a norm, right? So it's very important to understand the patch release latency. The next most important thing is how soon an exploit is being released or a threat is being released to the malware. Sorry, to the vulnerability, right? Whether it's an exploit or a malware. The next most important thing is how soon the threat is training. If you remember, everybody has recent memory of Spectra, struts, wanna cry, right? How many of those people will remember? It's not a lot. I mean, you're talking decade-centric 
threats, right? But it's important to understand it's not that every threat trends at an internal scale, but they do trend. Then it's important to understand how rapidly the IOC is getting distributed and how rapidly it's getting morphed. You want to look at the reference count both on social media, the dark web, and also from the security vendors. What's the tweet age? How many Reddit mentions is it getting? And is it, does it have a confirmed simulated compromise? In other words, did a human validate that? So there are several others that's going to it. So we have about, call it 45 to about 100 features we use to make sure our models are accurate and we're doing a good job. And the most important thing is you consistently have to do your feature ranking. It is important to only collect the features that will allow you to make proper decisions. Again, it's super important to pay attention to this. So with that, now let's talk about a simple link analysis, right, a graph model. So you remember when I was talking about fraud, the most important thing would be to build the relationships and derive the context. Let's say I'm Bob. That's a unidimensional information, right? I'm a person. Then if I know my profession, it's typically what you're trying to do is based on my profession and based on the patterns you see within the profession, what are the typical places we go to, we shop from, what do we do, right? And then when you combine that with somebody you're related to, you can get even more further context. What is that you can get? It's the geolocation, right? Let's say if I'm married and we're in the same household, it's very likely when we are traveling, you can correlate that both our transactions are coming from a geolocation. They're coming from the same devices we use, right? We have similar buying patterns or we have similar financial transactions. So there are a lot of things that can come in and reinforce your connection, right? So that level of link analysis is super, super important not only at the human level, but also taking that extra step to the device and the type of transactions you do from those devices, right? Again, it's the source asset, your destination asset, that's very important. Now, what's the problem here? The biggest problem you probably heard today in fraud is synthetic IDs. I mean, there's a lot of interest on trying to solve a synthetic ID problem, right? However, we are not that successful at it. What this means is it's a fake name attached to a real ID. What is the most common issue with synthetic IDs today? It's the randomization of your social security numbers after 2011. And it's also the young, underage social security IDs. By the way, your social security system, your checker, your validation will pass through because it's a real ID, right? then what other attributes do I need? It doesn't quite go back and map your physical address. It doesn't go back and map your age. It doesn't go back and map, oh, this guy doesn't have an account with me. This is a fresh account. By the way, for synthetic IDs, that's good enough because they're establishing a record. If that works, they'll take it and attach it to an already compromised account as an authorized user. So there are a lot of things that go in as an individual steps. If you don't have the link analysis, if you don't have this data connected, it's very hard for you to bust the fraud ring, right? So again, the reason I'm giving you these examples is these are the precursors. Today we have data that we're collecting, but we're not bringing all the data together and combining that with the cybersecurity data for us to get the best bang out of the buck, right? So the concept of synthetic IDs is very important because that's typically used to commit fraud. And of course, your cybersecurity and large volumes of breach data will allow synthetic ID problem to be exponentially harder to detect, right? And of course, are there ways we can implement better ways to validate this? Of course, there are. But that's where the industry is moving towards and the financial sector is doing a very good job in addressing this problem. Then comes, what are the key features that are used for fraud? User identity, we just talked about a root problem in synthetic IDs, right? We're talking about system identity. If you go back a couple of years, three, four years, today they request you to register a device. Why do you think they're asking you to do that? They're trying to capture your browser footprint 
They're trying to capture your device footprint. They're trying to capture the IP address you're coming from. They're trying to capture your geolocation. They're collecting different system attributes. And if you are deviating from any one or two of them, depending on how sensitive the fraud detection is, they throw you a challenging question. They'll push you back to a two-factor authentication, right? So there are a lot of things that got implemented in the last four years to address the fraud, right? Then the key is access logs. Access logs give you a lot of behavioral patterns so that you can build those decision points. The geolocation is a very important thing, both from a source and a destination. The device type you're using, the transaction data, right? The type of transactions you're carrying out. And the most important thing, which I personally believe we don't use quite well today, is compromised identities. I'll give you a simple example. Let's take Marriott for an example. If there are 100,000 IDs compromised in a Marriott breach, what is the data that's being dumped? Your first name, last name, your physical address, your credit card information, Right? If you applied for a marriage credit card, your social security at that point, your behavior, your preferences. I mean, think about it. If it's a hotel, you have the history where you've been traveling to, which physical locations you have been to, and your habits, right? So there are a lot of things that go in with compromised data from one of your retails because they're collecting that behavior. Because Marriott is collecting that behavior to give you a personalized service, it's a good intent. By the way, an attacker can use that exact personalized intent to create a synthetic ID and beat your fraud detection system. So it's super important to understand how can I take that upper air knowledge. If it's already a compromised account, then I'm going to make my fraud detection ultra sensitive to those IDs, right? And I'm going to reinforce extra authentication. I'm going to reinforce transaction check. So these are some of the things you can start thinking about from a fraud perspective. Then what are the other things you ought to be looking at? Transaction frequency. Right after the breach, you can see hundreds of accounts being created, right? So this is where you want intercommunication within the financial institutions. After a breach, can we all communicate to see if this particular identity is creating a credit card account with Citi, with Chase, with Matt, I mean, name the banking account, right? However, the common denominator is to go back to the five card brands, right? Visa, Master, JB, Discover, Amex. Can they be the clearinghouse on saying, ah, suddenly I'm seeing this guy come through five financial institutions to create five credit cards? Is that a possibility? That's transaction frequency. Time between transactions. Is he doing it as a serial? Is he doing a greedy approach, creating every single thing the same day? What's the min-max of the transaction value? Because you typically see a dollar charge, a 10 cents charge to validate the card, and suddenly you see a $3,000 charge, right? And you start looking at the source IP addresses. Are they using anonymizers? Are they using a simple ISP, but rotating within that ISP? Are they being persistent? What are they talking in the dark web? Are they selling this data and validating the transactions, right? And again, can we simulate the exact behavior and see how good a fraud detection is. So these are some of the things to consider, some food for thought here. I think it's very important to look at what features contributed so you can, better, you can build a better system. Then ultimately, the most important thing in a, a, any AI or any machine learning is transparency. What does it mean? You want to make sure what data was it based on. Super important, you want to reference your sources. If people don't believe your sources, they're going to discount whatever you're doing. The next most important thing is, do we have complete access to the data collection and the data corpus? You remember my initial observation is, if I don't have reusable data and systems of record and systems of truth, all bets off, no matter what I do, will be discounted and I might not get the desired outcome. Who trained the AIs is important. What is their expertise? Do they have experience in cyber? Do they have experience in risk? Do they have experience in fraud? What is their background? How are you vetting their thought process? You remember AI bias? If they're biased, your system will be completely biased, and you want to make sure you go to that. 
And who will update the system? Is it a daily process? Is it a weekly process? Is it a monthly process? Again, very critical, your machines should be dynamic in nature and it has to be a iterative process. You learn something where the faults are good, you want to pack your system and you want to retrain your system so it's good. And how are we validating, right? I mean, is it a human validation or a machine validation? Again, that's super important. It's a combination that works the best. And does your system have the ability to provide human feedback? And if you take a look at most of the chatbots and the most of the process automation today, all of them take some sort of a human interaction and a human feedback. Good examples are Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, right? All these are some very good examples for you to really see how these things are working in an operational setting to death. So with that, the most important thing is, what are we doing today? Where do we want to be? So I gave you an example of NVD today. We're doing it as a siloed. If you remove NVD as a training data set, you can put in a fraud detection data set, and you can still do fraud detection, right? However, it's a complete black box approach. You don't know what the learning, true learning function is. You don't know what the output is, right? Ultimately, you as an end user, you don't even know why did I do that? Why not something else? When do you succeed? When do you fail? When can I trust you? How can I correct? It just becomes a complete arbitrary guesswork, right? Versus where should we be evolving? if we can bring in transparency into an artificial intelligence system. So our interest today is how do we converge both the cybersecurity and the fraud data. The beauty is your learning machines can consume the data as long as you're very thoughtful about what your input is, what your output should look like. If you have those things aligned, then we have a play here. Then what you would do is you would take the data in and you want your model to be explainable. At every individual step, you wanted to tell this is the input, this is the output. This is the input, this is the output. So you understand very clearly what's going and what's being processed and what you're getting it. So you can actually train and change the models much more crisper than wait for the final run to happen. Then ultimately, you want to have an explanation interface, right? So it's in plain English, people understand it. And the most important in our particular case is we're looking at will attack lead to fraud or will fraud lead to an attack? I mean, either way, right? Either both of them are bad. We just want to look at the precursor, postcursor, postcursor, precursor. It's very important to look at it. And we want to know why, why not, how will I succeed? And if I fail, I want to know why I failed because it's lack of data, it's the wrong features, what is the reason I failed? And I want to be able to completely trust the model that I'm getting the right results. And ultimately, you want to know that this is something you can easily adapt, tune, and get to the next level. So finally, we're getting to our end of this. And if you take a look at how can we converge from a cybersecurity and a fraud perspective, you can collect the data from the dark net. You can collect the security data from your existing security tools. You can look at the trending threats and trending fraud events. You can look at the social media for indicators. You can also start looking at quite a bit from a breach information, who is being breached and what type of entities are being breached. Once you have this information, then how do you look at a fraud journey? It's the cyber risk that will allow you to be susceptible to a breach. When you have a confirmed breach, there will be a lot of anomalous activity, both from a user and a system perspective, and that's where you can really have a mechanism to detect and prevent not only an attack, but also a cyber breach and a cyber fraud based on the data and underlying elements you have. And finally, don't fear AI. AI is good. You can truly explore it. Use plain language so everybody understands it and supports it. Teach people how to utilize and benefit it. Siri is a good example. It's fantastic. I use it. I use Google Assistant as well. And also ensure, ensure, ensure you are addressing the AI bias before it becomes a real problem for your organization. With that, happy to take a few questions. Thank you very much, Srinivas. It looks like we have just a few minutes left, so maybe time for one or two questions here. Um, the first one that came in says, do commercial security products suffer from bias, or is it a result of the data that is fed into them? 
It's a it's a very loaded question, Julia. So the interesting thing is majority of the AI systems today have bias. The bias is introduced by three important factors. It's the type of data, the person or the team that's training the system, and then ultimately how frequently are we going back and adjusting the bias, right? It's the data and the person. It's, it's the two important attributes that actually introduce bias into the AI systems today. Great. It's not one thing, it's both. And the next question we have here says, are there any best practices for achieving data and training transparency? Yes, definitely, right? Make sure you have a comprehensive data set and you clearly understand what your features mean from a classification or a regression perspective. That's the number one thing. Then make sure your data is not sparse. You have a complete data set, if it is possible, but that's not a reality, right? And the next thing is make sure you have transparency into your learning models, step by step. Don't treat it as a black box. Understand how the weights are getting adjusted and why are they getting adjusted and what is an input and what's an output. So once you have that explainable process, I think you can stand behind your learning models and really be articulate about what happened and why it happened. And then one more question we have time for says, you had mentioned explanation interfaces. How common are explanation interfaces today? It is not a common practice. So that's where it's a new push by DARPA and by several AI behemoths. So it's a new concept and people have been talking about how do we actually give explainable interfaces. And there is a open challenge from DARPA for $2 billion to start creating AI models and AI systems with explainable interfaces. It's a very nascent field to avoid bias and to improve your AI models. So that's a new concept. Great, thank you. And due to time, um, we are going to have to move on to finish this presentation. So if we did not get to your question, we'll be reaching out to you individually to follow up. And with that, that brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thank you again to Srinivas for your time today. And thank you very much to all of our attendees for joining us as well. We hope you found this information valuable. If you have any other questions for Srinivas or the RiskSense team or would like to schedule a meeting to discuss further how RiskSense can help you take control of your cyber risk in 2019, please email us at info at You can also visit our website at www.riskSense.com to learn more about RiskSense or schedule a demo. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.